I, I I'll start from a general kind of remark. So this is about turbulence. This is about more or less traditional turbulence in a way of developed turbulence where having a cascade, we have pumping and dumping, which are very far away from each other. And uh, what this work and particular, it will have something which is partially overlap with what I talked uh, before. Uh, some of it's unpublished, some of it's not even written. But there will be a couple of new things in the end too. And I think that it's, it's a little shift of focus uh, as a way at least I now start looking at turbulence. Uh, I think that for a pretty long time since Richardson and Kalmogorov, we were focused on a cascade. And in a sense, we were thinking, trying to think in terms of kind of locality. So cascade is something which is local in, 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 in Fourier space. So we thought about this, you know, going from here to here to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. Of course, it's clear that we are talking about physical system, which interact uh, different, let's say, Fourier harmonics of velocity fields. They all strongly interact with each other. Even when we consider wave turbulence, in wave turbulence, uh, even in weak wave turbulence, there is still interaction of, of very different wave with each other. But somehow we were focusing uh, on a, which I believe was the simplest uh, uh, kind of energetic part of turbulence, namely the cascade with a focus on locality and also in the focus on simultaneous correlations. So if I think about, for example, Fourier space, I would say that we were interested in the occupation numbers which is a Fourier image of a second moment. Or we were interested in the flux, which is usually third or fourth cumulant, depending on what is your nonlinearity. And they were all single time. And, and of course, there is this, thanks to Uriel and many other people, there was this idea of multifractality and intermittency. Uh, but Again, when we were talking about it, we were generally asking, okay, we have a structure function on a given scale or Fourier harmonic, let's say we, we do shell models. So we have a UN at a given number of modes and we ask for higher powers of it. In a sense, we were asking how non-Gaussian is a distribution, statistical distribution of a given mode. And as we go along the cascade, it's getting more and more non-Gaussian and that's what we were focusing our interest in terms of uh, kind of uh, uh, strong fluctuations. What I now want to do, I want to do something non-local. And I think it's interesting. And I give a motivation uh, going back uh, almost 30 years to very famous work of Frank Wilczek uh, and, and, uh, and, and the development of it. They were talking about entropy of some critical uh, system, namely system which are at the phase transition, or system which are not in a phase transition and not critical. And, and so what was a statement uh, <coughs> made out that if you consider if it's a quantum object, and in this quantum uh, approach, you consider subsystem, and you consider its entanglement entropy with the rest of the system. And then you ask how this entanglement entropy can scale with the number of your degrees of freedom. And what Wilczek suggested that it can scale logarithmically, because you're you not talking about thermodynamic entropy, which always scales uh, linearly in the thermodynamic limit. You can see the kind of next subleading term, interaction entropy, entanglement entropy, or mutual information, it will be in classical things. But the statement was that it's proportional to the logarithm of the number of degrees of freedom. And the factor in front is something very important in quantum field theory. It's kind of a central charge, which is being translated into a normal physical language, is a number of degrees of freedom per unit, number of effective degrees of freedom per unit degree of freedom. So in a sense, if you look at a chain of spins, then you ask, but how much is actually a, a, a given spin, uh, how much uh, effective degrees of freedom it has because it interacts with every other spin. So that was initial idea. And if you consider system which is not critical, this 
uh, entanglement entropy would be finite. It would not grow uh, with a, a number of degrees of freedom in your subsystem. So in a way, it was a statement that you can identify critical states in which there are fluctuations of different scales from a non-critical states. You would look at its entanglement entropy or mutual information, and you see if it grows logarithmically with a number of degrees of freedom. This is essentially uh, was an idea, and then uh, Pitaev uh, and, and then many other people, uh, John Cardi, it really did it. So there are, it's very difficult to compute entropy of many degrees of freedom. Uh, just imagine that you have multidimensional space, you need to have a distribution in this space, you need to have a, enough beans field, and then you need to compute a mean logarithm. It's practically impossible for degrees of freedom which are beyond, I don't know, five or six. Uh, but in uh, Kitaev and Elizabeth uh, found some system in which they're kind of integrable in the sense that you can many things compute analytically and then some things compute numerically. And what is shown here is again, now it's a very famous paper published 10 years later after Wilczek, uh, uh, 20 years now before, and it shows you a different systems and it's not that important. This is kind of some system. So those which are of criticality have their entropy saturated with a number of uh, uh, degrees of freedom and systems which are at criticality have this entropy logarithmically growing and the factor in front of it indeed corresponds. Richard. Okay, yes. Richard. Uh, yes. Quick question: How is entropy defined here? Entropy is defined as a mean logarithm of probability distribution. Is a standard Gibbs definition. So you have a probability distribution. If you work with twenty spins, you just it, it's probability distribution in a twenty-dimensional space, and you take logarithm of this probability and compute average. That's your entropy. Now, if you compute entanglement entropy, it's different. You take your subsystem, you uh, compute its density matrix, which is means that it's some kind of probability. It's it's a quantum uh, statistics of a given subsystem in in a contact with a large thermostat, and then you compute von Neumann entropy. If you do it classically, you can do it as following thing: you can take uh, your big system divide it into two, some interval with L sides and the rest. And then you compute entropy of the whole system and you subtract entropy separately of your interval and entropy of outside. What is left is a degree of correlation between your subsystem and the big system. It's called mutual information in a classical system. It's called entanglement entropy in the quantum system. It's something which characterizes degree of correlation. Or a difference of your probability from a product. It's a degree of uh, of, 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 of non-independence of system. Okay, that was uh, a, a preamble. And now I, what kind of system I will consider? I will consider eventually shell models, but just few words of motivation. It goes back to this uh, observation of Arnold that earlier equation for uh, uh, solid body, here M is a momentum of rotation of solid body, omega is its frequency, which is linearly related to momentum. This is earlier equation for the solid body rotation. It has a quadratic nonlinearity because M and omega linearly related. And it's a finite dimensional analog of other earlier equation, which is infinite dimensional, which is the equation of fluid, of uh, ideal fluid motion. If you write it for vorticity, it has this form where is a quadratic uh, uh, relation between uh, 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 right side is quadratic in omega because V is linearly related to omega. And then Omu have suggested to consider a generic classes of such systems for which you have a quadratic nonlinearity. What is important is that this system all have a quadratic invariant. They have an integral of motion, and for this, it's needed that this coefficient gamma satisfy this property. And you can check that this satisfied for uh, for all these cases. 
And what we recently added, we added to this another class. If you consider uh, interacting modes, if you wish, having frequency omega, so that's Hamiltonian as a quadratic part, which corresponds to linear part of a uh, uh, equation of motion, and cubic part, which corresponds to quadratic nonlinearity. And if your interaction coefficient is non-zero only for resonant modes, then you can do this transformation and you erase your linear terms from the equation of motion. And your equation has a similar form to this Obuchov or Arnold type system. Namely, it's a, uh, this quantity uh, a dot is proportional to quadratic. It's time derivative is quadratic. And you can show that this system has this invariant uh, integral of motion. OK, now what we do with it, we do turbulence with it. Namely, we switch uh, on porcing acting on it and dissipation acting on it. And uh, if forcing and dissipation are in a detailed balance, namely for every mod i, i is a number of mod, it runs from 1 to n. If you take both forcing, which is the amplitude of this uh, thing, and uh, uh, and dissipation, and uh, the ratio is constant. Here, f must be omega, sorry. Uh, then you're in a thermodynamic balance, and your probability distribution is beautifully trivial. It's just a product of Gaussian distribution. It's only in this case where you have a quadratic invariant, like what, uh, what uh, uh, all earlier equations have and what Obuchov system have. Then you have this family of thermal equilibrium, which are just quadratic, uh, which is exponent of Gaussian. Now we consider a very particular class of such system in which, let me probably return here, this uh, uh, V would be uh, Fibonacci. That's where Fibonacci appeared. I would later consider some kind of, of generalization where uh, K, uh, I, and J is just three consequent modes. It's the simplest a chain of interacting modes, only three modes are directly interacting in this case. And then uh, uh, I would be naturally uh, uh, asking about uh, what would be the flux of this conserved quantity. Now the conserved quantity is uh, respective Fibonacci numbers times squared amplitude. And again, Gaussian distribution is a logarithmic probability distribution is a sum of my all uh, conserved quantities. Now, if I write uh, something like equation on the DDT of my energy, what I will get in the right hand side is a triple moment. It's our standard triple moment, which we all get used to, it's a flux. So what I'm now deriving is an analog of a Kalmogorov four-fifths law. So if I really want a steady state, uh, I need a constant flux. If I have a zero flux, I have equilibrium, but I can have a constant flux, which corresponds to the triple moment J uh, times V uh, equal to some kind of Fibonacci number. And then I don't want to go into uh, mathematical details, but essentially this is something which you can, using the properties of Fibonacci, you can show that this is a stationary solution. It turns this combination of triple moments into zero. And that's more or less a standard stuff. Uh, now uh, you can ask if it's a, a turbulence, then which direction the cascade goes. Because now you, your system is determined by a single quantity. That's how this V, which is a coefficient of uh, Hamiltonian, depends on the mod number. And we assume that it's power law, and this phi is a golden mean because Fibonacci is a, a, a golden mean uh, asymptotically. So for large numbers, the Fibonacci is just phi in the power i. And now we can guess which way uh, uh, the flux goes by a simple rule, which again I think goes back to Uriel's work. And see, so we just look at our. Uh, power law and compare it with equilibrium power law. So if our uh, uh, 
amplitudes decay relatively to equilibrium towards large modes, then the flux would go towards where there is less. Uh, and if there is a, a equipartition, then there would be no flux. And if there is a more at high modes, then the flux would be inverse. Gishan, so then we, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think you went a bit too fast for me. Um, how did you introduce Fibonacci into this problem? Yes, okay, so let me, that was, was probably indeed too fast. So what I'm now saying is that I probably, unfortunately, uh, not all finds are shown. Let me look back because I have this feeling that some far, some, yeah, sure, okay. That's that's the problem because uh, this file, this uh, slide was not shown. So let me return back. Thanks, uh, thanks for helping me because now I see why we from current slide. So you see this slide now. So this is a particular system in which I consider in the Hamiltonian only three subsequent mode interacting. I don't know why Zoom uh, skips slides, but this slide was skipped. Okay, so now in this case, uh, uh, this is the equation of motion. It is just variation of my Hamiltonian with respect to A complex conjugated. And this equation of motion conserve this family of quadratic invariant. So here Fibonacci are the following uh, quantity that f of i plus f of i plus one is equal to f of i plus two. You see, this is my interaction where the mod i and mod i plus one give me the mod i plus two. So it's a straightforward to show that if you take this quantity, take ddt according to this equation, then this sum gives you zero because of this property of Fibonacci numbers. So this is essentially why Fibonacci plays such an important role in nature and you know all pine coins and ananas and, and other uh, plants they have the Fibonacci arrangement because Fibonacci numbers is the two previous numbers give you the third one and that's how uh, in nature two mode give you the third mode okay so now when we have equilibrium we have equipartition of this Fibonacci so you take Fibonacci times pumping amplitudes divide by dissipation amplitude and it must be constant independent on i right uh, and that actually tells you that your mean occupation numbers are inverse fibonacci so if you take fibonacci number times it's your frequencies if you if you wish so if you take fibonacci numbers times occupation numbers it would be equipartition okay and that is uh, equilibrium, which means that in equilibrium, the mean values of AI squared behave like one over Fibonacci numbers. Okay. Now I'm doing turbulence. Namely, I am now requiring not the equipartition of my quadratic invariant by constancy of my flux. And it sets the scaling of a third moment. And now when I compute the scaling, I compute it in terms of the scaling of V, which is an interaction coefficient. So I have interaction coefficient, which scales like uh, uh, phi in the power alpha. And this alpha sets the scaling of my amplitudes beta. And now I am asking uh, when this scaling one plus alpha over three Concise with the scaling of equilibrium, which I remind you is one over Fibonacci, which means that it's one over phi in the power i. That's how Fibonacci behave. So when you compare this number with this, you see that it, they equal to each other for alpha equal one half. And it means that I do have a special subclass of my system with the scaling of my interaction coefficient uh, with alpha one half, where my scaling of equilibrium exactly the same as the scaling of turbulence. And it now, while I'm interested in it, you will see later, in this case, turbulence is close to equilibrium, but equilibrium is exactly Gaussian. Turbulence is not equilibrium, it must carry the flux, but it is a 
system which I was looking for many years where I can have turbulence uh, which could be treated perturbatively because in the zeros approximation, its statistics is that of thermal equilibrium and in thermal equilibrium, it's a product of independent Gaussians. Even though it's a system with strong interaction, its equation is, has a quadratic right-hand side. So this is a beautiful uh, system. And uh, now what I see is that if I take alpha, which is less than one half, then my cascade goes to the left, namely I switch pumping here at the mode uh, 50, and here is my pumping place. I have equipartition to the right and cascade to the left. When I consider alpha, which is Richard, larger than one half. Richard, yes? Excuse me. So you are talking about a case where you have Gaussians or product of Gaussians, but then how do you have, have a, but how do you have a non-zero third moment? Exactly. So this is a very good question. What I am saying is that if I have equilibrium, it is exactly Gaussian. And it has the scaling, which is uh, the following scaling. My occupation numbers are one over Fibonacci. Now I look at turbulence. I have a non-zero third moment, and it suggests another scaling. But I see that there is a single value of alpha where these two scaling coincide, which means that I will have exactly third moment it's definitely non-Gaussian statistics, but it's second moment as if it is thermal equilibrium. So I'm asking the question and I don't know the answer yet. And the answer will be in the end and it will be unexpected. That the, uh, uh, I'm asking the question, how close is my whole statistics to Gaussian? If it has a scaling like in thermal equilibrium, but it has third moment because it has a flux. Okay. Um, so you exactly ask the right question. Yes, other questions? No, and there's a comment which is can be quite outrageous. So I have seen the similar behavior in Galavorty Cohen shell model. It's a shell model. What I am describing is a particular class of shell models. And for shell models, you can always find a specific uh, value of parameter in which it will be similar. It also takes place for nonlinear Schrodinger equation for gross Pitayevsky equation in 2D. It's a very, uh, it's, 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 it's something which is not a full measure, but it's very often happens that the scaling of equilibrium is exactly like a scaling in turbulence. Statistics are different, but as you will see, we will see in a moment, the differences will be not in terms of scaling, but in terms of uh, logarithmic corrections. But what's more that we now can see is that we now can treat our system analytically. This is the first time I will be able to do analytical calculation of high order cumulants for, uh, because they will be small because system is close to Gaussian. Okay. Thanks. So what I'm now doing now, I'm just showing you that by uh, varying alpha, I change from direct to inverse cascade and taking alpha one half, I am exactly in this position where I'll be uh, 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 close to equilibrium. And now uh, I do see that when I uh, take my pumping, I take alpha one half and take my pumping, let's say in the middle, I will have a direct cascade and I would have an inverse cascade. So it's really, I'm in a balanced situation. I do have cascades, uh, but I also uh, having a scaling the same as in thermal equilibrium. And then I ask how Gaussian is my distribution? Okay, here is a logarithm of probability. Here is squared. And you see that it's pretty Gaussian for like, and it's a, by the way, speaking of shell models, this is a uh, absolutely a world of the art record, which Natalia did. Uh, this is 200 modes. It's very difficult to have shell, shell models with, with that number of modes, but we made it. And you see that even for 160 uh, and 20, there aren't that much difference. This is an inverse cascade, this is a direct cascade. And when you look at the ratio of moments, it approaches Gaussian. So indeed, if you look at a single mode, 
there is no multifractality. This is just Gaussian distribution, and it's not getting more on Gaussian as you go away from pumping, it's actually getting more Gaussian. Okay, so it really seems that you we can now work the system, and here is again uh, for different modes i here plotted on top of each other probability distributions or no this is actually moments right and as they just on top so it's a self-similar statistics of the mode you go along the cascade statistics of a single mode does not change and it's close to gaussian uh, but it's not exactly a repartition it's it's really distorted but it's distorted in a logarithmic way and uh, where is this? Uh, yeah, but of course there is third moment here, right? So I have a non-zero third moment, which means that there is correlation between of phases between mode i minus two, i minus one, and mode i, and I can look at the probability distribution of this uh, mode difference theta, and it's non-trivial, and it's different for uh, different for direct and inverse cascade. So for direct cascade. It has a maximum at, at minus pi over two. For the inverse cascade, it has a maximum of pi over two. So it's a non-trivial statistics, but you don't see it on a single mode. You look at three modes, aha, you see phase differences. And then you start asking, what can we say about higher cumulus? Okay. And in particularly, when we ask about this distortion, this is a logarithmic distortion of, of equipartition. You cannot have equipartition. In the equipartition, there is no flux. Flux must go from where it's a lot to where it's less. So here I'll show briefly uh, 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 analytic computation, which fortunately are possible in this system uh, because it's close to equilibrium. So how it's done? So first of all, uh, uh, I have some gauge invariants in the system. There are only subclasses of cumulants, which are non-zero. And those are such that, for example, if you take B on different modes, the sum of the Fibonacci must be zero. And when it's a, with a conjugation, then this Fibonacci comes with a sign minus. So essentially, this is the uh, gauge invariance, which is uh, true in the system, and only gauge invariant cumulants will be non zero. Okay, now let's compute them. So if I write how I compute it, I just write Hopf equation. I do time derivatives of subsequent moments. When I take second moments, which I can also call that this is C naught, which is just would be bi, bi complex conjugated. It's time derivative. It's a difference of a triple moments, as we already wrote. And it must be zero, which fixes the third moment. It tells that this moment is a constant. It just has the same value as I, I minus one as the value of I. This we already seen. It's an analog of a four-fifths law. Okay, now I want to go forward and write time derivative of a third cumulant. Okay, it's somehow notation which may be a little bit misleading. When there are two indices here, it's a third cumulant. Where there are three indices here, it's a fourth cumulant, etc. So uh, when I write this, uh, uh, equation again i have a right hand side because i have a quadratic nonlinearity so time derivative of a third moment is proportional to fourth moments so i have a combination of fourth moments and it's a mess but now i'm saying that when my alpha is one half and i'm really close to thermal equilibrium i assume that i can decouple this second this fourth order moments in terms of a second moment assuming that they are approximately Gaussian. And that means that this first line is the main part of it. So when it's exactly Gaussian, it turns into zero and all my cumulants are zero. But when it's a little bit distorted, it would produce immediately force order cumulants that must compensate for it. So by looking at this difference, I find out that it's proportional to one over uh, mode number counted from dissipation and that tells me that my force order cumulants must behave like my force order moments the main gaussian part suppressed uh, by one power of mode number 
okay now i can do it uh, next and next and next and then i can write a chain of such uh, uh moments which i will be solving iteratively uh, coming from the second one and i can do it for different models because every shell model has such a near gaussian point and eventually i derive the following statement first of all that my moments must scale indeed as a mod number in the power m over three and in particularly we already seen it in in the data of numerics but more important if i look at dimensionless cumulant namely i take a cumulant which is zero for gaussian distribution but it's non-zero because we are in turbulence and divide it by a modulus which is always non-zero and particularly have a gaussian value this ratio is small uh like one of a mod number namely as i go along the cascade it's getting smaller as i go away from from dissipation region it goes smaller and smaller but it's uniform in terms of order this is something which i found very surprising where we first uh well, I first seen it in analytics and then we did massive numerics. So this cumulant is small, but it's uniformly small for every order. So when I go to, from a triple cumulant to four soda cumulant to fifth soda to 25th order cumulant, they are all proportional and suppressed by the same power of, of mod number. Of course, there could be factorial factors related to the combinatorics of these uh, things, but at least at the face of it, this is the main surprise of this work. So you look at the flux, flux is the third moment, you measure uh, you, you, third moment, indeed, it's a flux. But then you go to force, cumulant, cumulant, not something which has a Gaussian reducible value, and it's not decreasing. And then we went to uh, <clears throat> check it uh, numerically, and it's a, a really uh, one can do absolutely fantastic numerics in this case because your uh, interaction uh, <coughs> time uh, and uh, means your time step it decreases with the mod number only linearly, not exponentially, as usually for shell models. That's why usually shell models are done for 20 modes or 40 modes, but we can do 200 modes and really resolve all these things because our time grows like this. And this is the result. So <clears throat> I, I'm looking at uh, force order cumulants uh, of this. There are two force order cumulants, this and this. There are different <laughs> five other cumulants with different combination and there are general cumulants and here are the numbers in the direct cascade in the inverse cascade and then as you go you see that the uh, values are actually not uh, decreasing they are growing when you look at a high order uh, cumulants you see that you go from something which is of order one or two to something which is of order 13 and 16. of course those aren't dimensionless so you really go and you look at dimensionless cumulants and uh, and first of all you check scaling they all when you scale them properly with the second moment they all scale the same but you see that the values of dimensionless they are comparable so this is the third this is the fourth, this is the fifth, and they all have comparable numbers. This is the uh, six, seven, and eight. This is really heroic uh, computational effort. And you see that they all more or less of order 0 0.2, 0 0.4. I cannot compute factors for high order cumulants. This is something which is already beyond. Uh, and uh, numerically, it's also not an easy a job because there are like 70 uh, cumulants of the seventh order so it's sorting it out it's a really a big work but what <coughs> one really finds out that generally this qualitative prediction that high order cumulants are comparable to lower order cumulants is here okay 
And uh, this is even uh, more data with even more exotic components. And you see how noisy are the data, but more or less uh, up we go to the eighth order. You see uh, similar things. Then we uh, uh, wanted to repeat it for a different model because maybe this is a something which is a particular property of this Fibonacci model. So generally, you can consider a more general Hamiltonian, which is essentially Obuchov consider. So you can have different P and Qs here. And in a Fibonacci case, P is one and Q is two. But you can take P is zero and Q is one. And this is a model which describes actually uh, frequency doubling. It's a second harmonic generation, if you wish. So it's a Hamiltonian in which two modes I would produce mode I plus one. Actually, people here in the, our laser lab, they are now uh, trying to build such a system in which you have a cascade, uh, not very long, <laughs> admittedly, of second harmonic generation. So it's a very physical system. Now <coughs> your omega is two in the power i, and it's in another example of such a chain. Again, you can have here alpha equal to one half, uh, <coughs> and uh, you can, look at cumulants and you can look at the scalings and uh, of different orders like here below you can see that you can make now this different gauge invariance but essentially it's it's very similar and you have similar scaling and you have similar uh, dimensionless values <clears throat> and then we look at uh, something which we started from namely entropy so entropy of a general distribution we cannot compute but if something is close to gaussian then it's uh, uh, different it's relative entropy of your distribution from gaussian will be an analog of entanglement entropy it will be a measure of non-gaussianity and correlations and then in a case where your deviation from gaussian not very large you can show that it is just a sum of all squared cumulants I don't know, this pro formula probably somewhere exists. Uh, I derive it myself, it's straightforward derivation. So if you assume that you have Gaussian distribution, if your logarithm of your distribution is a square plus a set of small cumulants, then your entropy, that your relative entropy is just a sum of squared cumulants. And so what we see here in the table, we see the sum of these cumulants for our H3, it's a Fibonacci model, H2, it's a Dublin cascade model, and it's dependence on the number, and it's a pretty irregular, but it's not decreasing. Grisha? So if you look at, yeah. This is relative entropy relative to what? It's a, in a sense, it's difference between entropy of non-correlated modes and the entropy of correlated modes. I see. Entropy of correlated modes is always less because there is some correlation, it decreases entropy. In the sense, I may say that when I deviate system from equilibrium with the same end energy, I make entropy less. And so I measure how less. And this is a measure of my correlations. And it includes all cumulants altogether. Now, if you would have uh, uh, this uh, cumulant small, it would be a small correction. So, if you would uh, have uh, your cumulants decaying like one over i squared, then for every cumulant, when you sum over i, it's a converging sum. Sum over of i uh, uh, one over i squared over i, it's something of order unity. But if you have a double sum, namely, you not only sum over i from m to n, but you sum over m, which is the order of your cumulants, from 3, which is the first non-trivial cumulants, to n, which is the whole length of your system. So now it is a logarithm. Okay? So it explains why we were so obsessed by checking out whether our cumulants decay with order. You see, third order, fourth order, fifth, sixth, sevens, they kind of look to it, but do not decay. They're more or less kind of numbers of comparable orders. And the same you see for doubling cascade. Is it makes us uh, 
conjecture. This is not something that I proved, no. This is, I derive it for first like uh, four, uh, five cumulants, and then we computed it for first eight cumulants, and then we made a conjecture. If an order of cumulants go into infinity, this ratio actually saturates on some number. This number is a kind of a central charge of our critical model because our uh, relative entropy grows logarithmically with the number of modes because it's a double sum. Each cumulant is one over i, cumulant squared is one over i squared, but if this number does not decay with an order, it really gives you a logarithm. At this point, it's a conjecture. We're now trying to do it with wave turbulence and it's very difficult. Unfortunately, I don't foresee in any future that one can compute really, uh, ex measure experimentally or do numerically entropy on, uh, let's say, you know, incompressible turbulence. I mean, it's, you know, the moment you are out of four dimensions or five dimensional space, it's very difficult to compute logarithm of, 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 of the measure, but there might be tricks and there might be different machine learning. There are some smart algorithms which tell you, which let your system by machine learning guess the shortest string of encoding of your sequence of data. And that could be a way to measure entropy of turbulence. Nobody yet uh, uh, did it, but if, this simple shell model to believe, we expect the entropy of turbulence to be less than the entropy of equilibrium with the same energy, and this difference would scale as a logarithm of a Reynolds number. So that's a prediction, that the entropy uh, decrease or, or, or correlation entropy of turbulence would scale as a logarithm of Reynolds number, and the factor in front would be a classifier. It would distinguish different classes of turbulence from each other. And uh, the last thing that I want to tell is something which is not even yet published, but it's not even yet written. It's surprisingly uh, uh, the statement which I did not believe uh, initially as, uh, when Natalia just found it, that the different time correlations between different modes are stronger than the single time correlations. So again, I took a triple moment of J minus, this is a Fibonacci model. So it's J minus two, J minus one, J complex conjugated. At the same instant of time, it's equal to unity because I normalized it by a flux and measure it as a function of T1 in the first and as a function of T2 in the second. Here is unity. It crosses unity at zero. It's really, but you see that it has a maximum which is 16 times larger uh, when I change T1 and about uh, 12 times larger. Or when I look at the uh, color plot of my cumulon on the plane T1, T2, it has this maxima more or less with when T1 equal to T2. There is some time shift which corresponds to some kind of a typical correlation time. And is this maximum is, uh, I don't know, 20, about 20 times larger than the flux. I always believed that the flux is a small part of a turbulent story. So we look at the energy dissipation rate and it's uh, some quantity. But if we look at it fluctuation, or in this case, it's different time correlation, it's much, much larger. So the mean energy flux is a very small part of, 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 of all fluctuations and correlation in the system. And I think that this multi-mode, we did not yet check what happens with four mode correlation different times, five mode correlation, we have some guesses. A long time ago, Eric Sidja uh, uh, with Arif, they did some numerics, very early numerics with shell models, and they claim that there are some pulses which run along the shell models and then some other people. I tried for a very long time trying to obtain a time dependent analytical solution of this equation in different cases and I, I never managed it. 
but apparently this different time correlation tells us that something is moving uh, along this chain and this something provides correlation which are much much stronger than the single time correlations and this is something which uh, just wait somebody to explore and we are now exploring the thing and i very much hope that we would be able to do it for a more realistic systems okay so now let me go to uh, the conclusion of my talk so first of all we consider a particular class of shell models uh, uh, the, the simplest are doubling model or fibonacci model they both allow for analytical treatment for a particular case of scaling where the scaling of turbulence is the same as the scaling of equilibrium. We have such case for, for nonlinear Schrodinger, and there it's much more difficult to do analytics. Here it's easier to do analytics because we have only time and mod number and there is no space in shell models. Okay, we see that uh, our turbulence has our equilibrium distorted, not as a power law, but logarithmically. It seems like, uh, for somebody who knows critical phenomena, it seems like a logarithmic case for Ising model. And that's what essentially my hope that I can do something like Wilson uh, epsilon expansion, but we're very far from it. We're still working in this D equal to four logarithmic case. What we find out surprisingly that it's not like in the Wilson case that you can treat second moment, uh, look at its distortion, look at third moment and it completely describes your system. No, your third moment is small because you're close to equilibrium, but your fourth or moment, your fifth moment, your sixth moment are all comparable to the third moment. As a result, your relative entropy namely your difference from gaussian distribution is not small it's logarithmic in your mod numbers so when you look at a single mode you think that you are gaussian when you look at two or three modes you think that you are gaussian but when you look at the whole probability distribution you are very far from gaussian because there are arbitrary long correlations in your system this is very surprising i find it's very interesting and I don't know to what extent it is generalizable uh, for other cases, uh, but I think that there is, well, at least for me personally, is this kind of shift of focus from uh, looking at a single mode or flux, which is kind of three mode for high order cumulus and trying to find a structure in this multi-mode correlation and in particularly uh, this assumption that it could be that uh, in other systems it also would be uh, non-decreasing with order or decreasing by some unexpectedly slow way which would provide entropy uh, of uh, uh, mutual information of turbulence indeed logarithmically dependent on realness number that would be very interesting but this is still a very simple uh, case Okay, so let me finish at this point and take questions if there are questions. Thanks very much. Questions? I, I think uh, uh, you made a statement, flux is a small part of the turbulent story. I mean, uh, uh, do you really consider that because uh, uh, it flux. If you look at the micro scale uh, or whatever it is, the translation is the most important entity in a turbulent system, and vorticity is produced by translation, translatory motion. And uh, in fact, even in the on a grass scale in any system, we are interested in flux. Uh, I mean, transport of uh, uh, fluid. Our velocities are important. Uh, the uh, uh, total mass flow is important, uh, even in a grass scale. So I, I, I don't know why I, if you can tell us why the flux is a small part of the turbulence story. I mean, uh, I'm trying to understand that. Yeah. So do you consider it's vorticity, just... vorticity as the, uh, uh, I mean, important part and not translation? 
No. First of all, it's a, what I showed is a very simple model for which there is no space. There's only Fourier space here, okay? So there is just modes. So uh, here, of course, if you are engineer uh, and you're interested in how much uh, drug, uh, how much energy you burn, then you're only interested in the third moment, which is the flux, which tells you what is the rate with which you burn energy. So this type of questions that I ask here are very far away from any practical points. That's why actually we started to address them only now. We were interested in, 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 in energies, right? Because it worked, because you pay for energy, right? And now these are questions are pretty esoteric from the viewpoint of engineer. But I think that for physicists, for me, I am more interested not in engineering question, but in, 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 in terms of how different is uh, non-equilibrium from equilibrium. This is my main motivation for study. Turbulence is a quintessentially non-equilibrium state. So I am asking how different it is, what, where I see the most dramatic difference. And in this system, and it's a very peculiar system, it's very dramatically different. So the moment I just change it a little bit, I it's close to equilibrium. When you look at any given mode, it's just an equilibrium, right? Uh, and it's very close to Gaussian, but it has correlation of arbitrary order. And this for me is a very interesting lesson. Thanks. But uh, I don't know how generic it is. Actually, I have uh, a minor comment, a minor question, and then a speculation. Um, I think the shell model work that you mentioned, where you have pulses going down the scale, uh, there was an instant on calculation by Thomas Bohr and his collaborator. Maybe that's what you had in mind. Thank you. I'll check it. Yeah. Uh, the definitely, yeah. This, uh, uh, these people uh, did a lot of, yeah. They, they did analytic instant on calculation. That's very I interesting. So, yes. I'll look. I, I look Bohr, into it. Thank you. Bohr, Morgan, Morgan Jensen, and some other people. Maybe Vulpiani. Uh, the mm -hmm. other thing that I'm curious to know is that in your monster simulation, what kind of time stepping are you using? Yeah, essentially, we use uh, a, a time step. Uh, we, of course, we do it empirically. So we just we, we in, uh, uh, increase time step until it starts changing or we decrease it until it stops changing but it's in terms of non in terms of non-linear uh, 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 non dimensionless interaction time so if you your interaction time is proportional to your amplitude right so if you your amplitude are normalized by unity then your interaction time is of order unity in this terms it is 10 to minus 3. I see. No, but so we found that ten to minus three is usually enough. But it, it but it means that this, uh, our time uh, interaction time changes with the mode. It's of the shortest I, I when not, you go towards. I yeah. was not asking about the time step. I was worried that because you have a wide range of scale, this will become an extremely stiff problem, and then maybe you need uh, time steppings which are kind of take care of the stiffness. I was asking if you're time stepping, what kind of time stepping you are using? That, I can, it's I can a beauty. Look. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's the beauty of this uh, 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 case alpha equal to one half that uh, in this case, your time independent on the mod number in the main approximation. Because usually, for if you take any alpha, if you take arbitrary shell model, your typical interaction time exponentially decreases with the yes, mod exactly. number. So your time step need to exponentially decrease. Yes. That's why people cannot do many modes. But alpha one half is a case where your interaction time linearly decreases with a mod number, and then it's manageable. I see. Of I course, see. we need to resolve the fastest modes. Okay, okay that's very interesting. And um, now the speculation part. Um, so you can, for example, people these days talk about entropy looking at reversibility. Right, so you could, for example, look at the irreversibility of the third order moment. And could you calculate some entropy by looking at the positive and negative flux and the distribution of that and so on? You understand? Yes, I'm... yes, it's a, a, you're right. First of all, 
uh, when I'm talking about entropy of turbulence, I'm talking about entropy of all modes. But you can take any quantity. For example, third moment is a fluctuating quantity. It has its own probability distribution. It has its own entropy, right? And, and so you can uh, look at, at partial entropy or margin or entropy of marginal distribution. Let's say you integrate everything except three modes. Such entropy can be computed. And it's not logarithmic in Reynolds number, as far as I can see. But again, it depends on the system. But what I was here trying to uh, speculate is about entropy of the whole, you know, multidimensional. Yeah, how it scales with a number of degrees of freedom. We have we have one more question from the back, please. Yes, yeah, so I have a question regarding this uh, fourth order cumulant. So when you write down the time evolution equation for third moment, and it consists like fourth moment term, and at equilibrium you showed that uh, fourth moment will vanish. So what is the physical reason behind that? I mean, the physical reason is that I've chosen this alpha equal one half. It's a very degenerate case in which uh, my I know that there exists an exact solution of this equation, which is thermal equilibrium, which corresponds to Gaussian statistics, namely all fourth order moments could be decoupled as products of second moments and all cumulants are zero. I know that this is a solution. Now I'm looking for a solution which is close to it because my scaling is such that my distribution is close to it. I am not guaranteed that it exists, but I found that it does. Then I assume that I uh, expand this, assuming that it's close to equilibrium, but a little bit different, okay? This is a perturbative calculation and it gives me force moment suppressed relatively to the uh, uh, force cumulant suppressed relatively to the force moment. Thank you. It's an assumption, it's self-consistent assumption if you wish. Anybody else? Maybe not. Maybe not. Is, is there anyone on the Zoom who has a question? So Grisha, thanks very much for the talk.